Traditionally, palliative care has um, been applicable to people with cancer. However, the disease burden for people with advanced respiratory disease, heart failure, dementia, has been shown to equal that of people with cancer. However, palliative responses aren't often routinely included in the disease framework. So the Hospice Foundation, along with the HSE in 2007, uh, established a study called Extending Access to examine the role of palliative care for people with diseases other than cancer and examined, looked at dementia, heart failure and advanced respiratory disease. The Palliative Care for All report was published in December 2008 and this um, outlined the findings of the Extending Access study. One of the key recommendations was to um, identify uh, how palliative interventions could be included within the service model for these diseases. Um, and funding was sourced f for, from the Hospice Foundation, from Baxter Foundation, from the Alzheimer's Society, the Irish Heart Foundation uh, and the Department of Health and Children um, to undertake action research projects in this area. We had a competitive process and, and out, out of that we have now three sites for these action research projects. St James's Hospital along with Our Lady's Hospice is examining the role of advanced respiratory disease for, and palliative care. The Matter Hospital and Connolly Hospital along with St Francis Hospital Hospice are looking at the role of heart failure and palliative care. And the Dementia Project it will be based in Clare Mental Health Service with collaboration of the Milford Hospice. All the sites will also be um, involving the primary care teams. The action, the three project officers commenced in January 2010 and these are two-year projects um, and we hope that the findings from, from these projects will be um, inform practices in the HSE throughout and how palliative interventions can be in included routinely in their care. Um, we'd be very conscious working in palliative care of the numbers of patients who have a non-malignant diagnosis who can't access services. In, I think so much of using action research is, means bringing about change and I think once you start to bring about change you're talking about some of the barriers and resistance that there is to change whether it's the lack of involvement or you know poor communication or perhaps that are already in place you know that there may be inadequate systems that people are already overburdened I think then the benefits of using action research is that many of these barriers are broken down because it's a very participatory uh, approach and it's very collaborative it's about bringing people in to a communicative space where they can all speak, where people can speak openly and all on the same level. Um, I think also in the area of um, palliative care for, for non-malignant diseases, it's a very new area and I think the benefits of using action research is that you're bringing this, this approach to an area that requires something that's innovative, that's inclusive, uh, that's collaborative and also bridges this theory, um, practice theory Action gap. That research exists. and methodology is all about working with people. Research in the past, you know, um, methodology has been looked at um, research on people or research for people but never really looked at research with people. We we're implementing a person-centred care culture into our workplace and um, it brought about great change for us within our workplace because it made it very real for us because it was it was um, changes that we we saw. We we were we came together as a group and we looked at, what, at our practice of what we were doing, and we could see ourselves the changes that need to be made. And we also um, gathered information from residents, their families, other staff members, and brought it all together and came up with action groups of exactly where the changes need to, need to occur and from those action groups then we brought about change and again it was done collaboratively with the rest with all stakeholders with the, with the medical team with the nurses with the non-nurses with the families with the residents so and it worked very well and the, the real good thing about action research is it brings about sustainable change. I would think that maybe we could demystify palliative care. I think at the moment a lot of people view it as end-of-life care and they don't see it as supportive care through a chronic life limiting illness and I think that's something we might be able to change. I think maybe communication will come out from this project. I think we will all learn better communication skills and I think 
patients will benefit from better communication um, from the multidisciplinary team. And I think chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and advanced respiratory illness in particular have a lot in common with advanced cancer. The symptom burden of these patients is very, very severe sometimes, increasing breathlessness and fatigue. Um, the problems faced by the families in terms of what to do, in terms of bringing somebody into hospital again, decisions about end of life care, I think they're all complex and they're all difficult. So my view has been for a long time that specialist palliative care has a lot to offer, but it's how to um, establish those links, how to actually develop the dialogue, both with the respiratory teams working in the hospital and community, the home care teams, and of course the general practitioner and the community-based well, team. What we have found is that in respiratory medicine, um, there at present does not exist any defined pathway of care to provide palliative care for our patients. Um, and we would have a lot of patients who suffer, for example, with very severe emphysema, lung fibrosis, bronchiectasis, or even neuromuscular diseases that can affect lung function, who are suffering and who do not have a defined pathway in place uh, to deal with that. Um, and for them, uh, the sensation, particularly of shortness of breath, um, is every bit as, as distressing uh, and as important as, for example, the sensation of pain or nausea that you might get in, in other diseases. So we were very pleased with the opportunity to explore uh, a defined uh, treatment protocol or pathway for these patients because up till now it has been done on a somewhat uh, patient by patient or ad hoc basis. What's going to happen over the next two years will be around developing dialogue mm -hmm. and how we can best develop a model of care um, to provide good palliative care for these patients um, and also to empower the GPs and to empower the respiratory teams. Palliative care has a lot to offer. I mean, we're, we're experts in symptom management, so we should be able to offer something in terms of the management of complex symptoms. Um, equally, we have uh, expertise in end-of-life care, and I think a, a lot of the interest is going to focus on patients who have repeated admissions to hospital with end-stage respiratory disease, that group of patients who maybe want to make choices about their end-of-life care. And I think palliative care has a lot to offer there. The challenges, the challenges will be who to determine um, or what to determine the patient population is. So how to decide who we should be involved with. That's going to be a big challenge. And the next big challenge will be what are the interventions that we're going to define? What is going to be a useful palliative intervention for this population of patients? Uh, for example, is referral to the day hospice going to be a useful intervention? Is commencement of opioids going to be a useful intervention? And I think those are the challenges that we're going to face. Um, our team anticipates that at the end of the action research project we will have a, a clear idea of how we want to provide care for patients with advanced respiratory disease in the future and we're hoping that we will be able to talk to patients about um, their life-limiting disease at an earlier stage so that they will have time to prepare to live the remainder of their life and that they can make plans of where they want to be cared for at the end of life and where they want to die, as well as their families and carers. And we also hope that we will acquire the necessary skills um, to communicate that to patients and their families as well as manage symptoms better than we've done in the past. Okay. A person with dementia has the same hopes and beliefs um, as any other person who lives their lives and has thoughts about death. You know, that we want the same things. Um, that we want autonomy and dignity. Um, and love, laughter, and I suppose probably the most important thing uh, for somebody is no regret. And I would sum that up by, I suppose, a spiritual peace. Um, and I think the challenge for the healthcare professionals is to incorporate the person-centered care and the the skills that we will learn as part of our p knowledge of palliative care interventions 
um, into making it as, as complete as possible for that person. The main challenges are probably um, the challenges that are specifically related to the specialist area of dementia, uh, particularly in that people with advanced stages of disease uh, will have uh, automatically have difficulty communicating um, verbally. So uh, there is a challenge in making sure that staff are trained and experienced and skilled enough to start picking up um, what are the specific uh, palliative care needs of people who are not able to communicate that directly with them. And also there are, are possibly challenges related to the whole area of stigma um, in that possibly uh, the term palliative care attracts a certain amount of stigma in the same way that um, the term psychiatric care can attract stigma and the combination of these two areas may also prove to be a certain uh, challenge. Approach the family as part of our person-centred care approach it, we couldn't ignore the thoughts of their end-of-life care and we had to discuss with them insofar as was possible and with their families what we believed or what did they believe that their loved one would like and it was very interesting because um, although they had all as a family thought about it none of them had discussed it with, the, with each other and it gave them the opening to have a discussion around their needs and I think what we learned was that we must always go back and keep checking and keep discussing it with them as to whether they remained happy with continu continuing with that plan or whether they needed to change it, which was always something that they could do. Um, I suppose what we would really hope is that this project might provide us with the opportunity of developing a roadmap for the provision of palliative care to people with non-malignant disease and our particular focus of interest in our own project is around about providing palliative care for patients with end-stage heart failure. And it's um, a subject close to our hearts in the matter just about managing the end-of-life care for our heart failure group of patients. And it's a journey just not alone for us but it's also a journey for the patient and we feel privileged to be part of that because patients have families and they want to have some involvement at the end of life care. So I see it as, you know, uh, being part of UNIQUE. It's a framework that's going to be a national document and that we, we have some very valuable experience to contribute to it, not just alone for ourselves, but also for the patients and their families. Again, uh, there are a lot of challenges. I suppose you could broadly divide them into challenges facing the individual, organisations and perhaps the speciality as a whole. Uh, for example, uh, challenges facing the individual health or social care practitioner would lie in the fact that um, those of us working in palliative care really are experienced in providing palliative care predominantly to patients with cancer, uh, motor neuron disease and perhaps HIV AIDS. Uh, we really have very little experience of caring for patients with end stage heart failure and in fact it may have been many years until, uh, since we've last come in contact with, with such a patient. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a big challenge there I think overcoming the education uh, deficiencies in, in knowledge base and skills. Um, and then finally if you look at the speciality of palliative care we have a model of care that works very well for patients with cancer um, but it is likely that the needs of patients with non-malignant disease such as end-stage heart failure will differ in some ways from the cancer population and as such uh, the question is whether we um, adopt the model as we have for cancer and unthinkingly apply it to, to uh, people with end-stage heart failure or whether we make some modifications and hopefully this project will provide us the opportunity to answer some of those questions.